Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to Oxygen for the Soul. Um, this week's parasha is Parashat Shemot. And this is the second uh, book of the book of, uh, of the five books of uh, Moshe. And the question is, why do we call it the book of Shemot, the book of names? You know, um, you know, the book of Genesis, the book of Reshit, I understand. And even our uh, English translation by, you know, early Christians, they call it the book of Exodus, uh, which makes, I think, a lot more sense than calling it the book of uh, names, uh, because what do names have to do with the whole entire book? Um, you know, we, the book is really about redemption. It's about how we ended up in Egypt and how our families ended up, uh, you know, uh, locked away in, in Egypt and the suffering they went through and the story of the, of the salvation and the redemption of our people. And the question is, well, what do we gain by calling it the Book of Names? And I think that this insight will help us get a deeper appreciation of what this second book is actually driving at. Um, so let's start, okay? Maybe we should ask a question, what is a name? Parsha begins with ve'ele shemot b'nei Yisrael, and these are the names of the Jewish people habaim mimitzrayim, ma, that are coming down from Egypt, right? Uh, at Yaakov ishu beto ba'u right? Yaakov comes with his whole entire family. They end up in Egypt, and this is where we left off last week. Last week we left off with the brothers um, saying goodbye to Yaakov. Yaakov trying to reveal the end of history. Um, and the, instead giving them all blessings. And in this week's parasha, um, again, just starting up with Ve'ele Shemot B'nei Israel. And, you know, what does Ve'ele mean? Ve'ele Vav? Just say Ele Shemot. What do we mean? And the. Ve'ele. So, Chachamim tell us the Vav is trying to connect us to the book before. The Vav is always a hook. The Vav's job is to connect us to what was before. Okay? And how is it connected? You'll see soon. Then the Pasuk continues and tells us the names of the Shvatim. Ruven, Shimon, Levi, Yehuda, Yisachar, Zevulun, Benyamin, Dan, Avtali, Gad, Asher. They call Nefesh, Yotze, Yerach, Yaakov. And these are all the descendants from ja- Yaakov, who were 70 souls. These were the 70 souls that uh, ended up in Egypt. Okay. Um, the Yosef, Hayav, Mitzrayim. And Yosef uh, was already in Egypt. Okay. So, Vayamat uh, Yosef, and Yosef dies. Vikol Echav, and all of the brothers. Vikol Dorahu, and the whole generation, everyone dies out. This is a, the beginning of the book of Exodus. So we hear about these prominent people, these amazing, you know, characters. We know all about them, their nature, their blessings, their weaknesses, their strengths. And now they all die. And the Torah needs to emphasize this idea, Vayamat Yosef, and Yosef dies, and the whole entire generation dies along with him. However, okay, this is where it gets interesting. Ubnei uh, Yisrael and the children of Israel, Puru v'yishrutsu, they were fruitful and they, v'yishrutsu is a very strange word, and they swarmed. The, uh, you know, v'yatsmu b'ma'od ma'od, v'timala aratz otam. And they were, became very big, they had lots of children, they became very strong, and the land became filled with them. Rashi tells us, Vishratsu, Shahayu Yolodot Shisha, Bekerkam Echad. They would give birth six kids at a time. Imagine giving birth, um, imagine giving birth, you know, uh, a few times, and those few times now you have, you know, uh, three times you give birth, and each time is six kids. So, boom, you have three, three births, and you have 18 children. <laughs> okay. Um, so, well, you know, what is this word, Vishratsu Virbu? So what's interesting is that, you know, we hear these names of these people, okay? These are the sons of the children of Yaakov. And now we don't hear anything. We just hear Bnei Yisrael. No names. That, that we're all put into one big category. And we're compared to a Sheretz. You know, anyone here know what a Sheretz is? A Sheretz is like a, a creepy crawly thing. It's a, a, actually Vishratzim is reptilian. And maybe Rashi gets this idea that they would give six at a time is because a reptile would often give birth to six children at a time. And this was this idea of shratzim, that they were reptilian. They were swarming. These are, these are, this is the word you use for bugs. Not a very uh, um, you know, polite, uh, gracious word to use for our people. Right? And now the Sforno says something different. Listen to what the Sforno says. Be'elu Shemot. And these are the names. El HaNiskarim Bekan. They're mentioned over here, right? They're, they're mentioned, they, they were mentioned here with their names. Okay, the to let you know. 
that each of them possessed a certain amount of individuality to give meaning to his name. And therefore, the names, he says, are all listed over here because they're special, okay? But when it goes, says, that, that's why we're, we're, we're listing all the names of the Shvatim at the beginning. Those are the names. The names are there because each Shevet, each person, was uniquely special, they had a special power. But then it says, Vakol Hador Hahu, the whole generation, right? Well, now we're talking about everyone. We have no idea who that door is. These are 70 people. And they were, um, you know, already assimilating into the Egyptian culture. Peru Vishutsu, he says. Okay. Va'achra shemetu kol nefesh. After these 70 people died, natu ledarche sheratzim. They took on the lifestyle, like, of that of creepy insects. Right? Creatures headed for destruction, he says. Sheratzim leba'er shachat. And the question is why? Why is he saying this? this? is a very different interpretation. Most of the interpretations that you'll read on the book of, or the Midrashim, that you're going to read about the book of Shemot, are going to talk, tell you that the Jewish people did three things. They preserved their identity. They didn't change their names. They didn't change their language. They didn't change their clothing. But according to this Sephardo, he's saying something different. He's saying this is a criticism. He's actually going to say without saying it, that the reason why they're going to lead to enslavement, which didn't happen yet, we're going to see in the Pesukim in a moment, that the reason why they were enslaved is because they took on natu ladarche sheratzim. Why? Because they assimilated into the, they already assimilated into the people. That means the, there was 80 years of reign of Yosef, okay, after which he passes away. And now the Jewish people become, you know, Egyptians. And they take on Egyptian culture for themselves as their identity, and they lose their names. Listen to the Pesukim. It gets interesting. There are no names to the faces, or names or faces, to the people that are enslaved over here in Egypt. Okay? We just know that they're, 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 they're having lots of kids. Okay? Which should be a good thing. But over here, according to the Sephardim, no, it sounds like a negative thing. And all of a sudden, as a result of these Jews assimilating into this Egyptian culture, what happens? Vayakam melech hadash al Mitzrayim. There's a new king that rises up in Egypt, Asher lo yada et Yosef, who did not know who Yosef was. And over here, Rashid tells us, Rav Shmuel, Chadomer Chadash Mamash. There's two opinions over here in this Pasuk. How do we understand who is this king? According to one opinion, it was a Mamash, a new king, a totally new king, not correlated to the king before. And lastly, the Chadomer Shid Chadshu Gzerotav, then no, this was really an old king, but he put out new decrees on the Jewish people and changed his mind as if he did not know uh, Yosef and who the Jewish people were. He made himself like he did not even know who Yosef was. Listen to what this king says. Okay, this is the first, one of the first very clear uh, anti-Semitic remarks that are mentioned in the Torah itself. And now this king says to his people, These children of Israel are more numerous and stronger than we are. Hava nidchachma lo. Let us deal very wisely or shrewdly with them. Pen yerbe v'haya ki tikre'enam elchama v'nosef gamahu al sonenu v'nelachem banu v'ala min ha'aretz. We agree, we've got to be very careful with these people. They are growing so fast that they're going to take away, they're going to replace us. By the way, what does this sound like? This was sounds like some of the protests that happened in, in, in America not too long ago, where you had people chanting, we will not be replaced by Jews. It's the fear. We're the smallest group in the world. And I imagine even though the Jews back then were growing and having larger families, they still did not outnumber the amount of Egyptians that were in Egypt. So what was the fear about? Right? What was the fear about? What were they afraid of? Okay, so what are we going to do? He says, he says, How do we go ahead and get the Jews? You know, we get them. We're going we're to make them pay a lot of taxes. This is how we get Jews to suffer. Make them pay high taxes. You can have all those kids. Not only you have to pay for those kids, but now you got to pay taxes too. Right? So he pointed out these tax collectors to afflict them. But that wasn't enough. And they built store cities for Paro. They were called Pitom and Ramses. Okay? They imprisoned them and convinced them that says, hey, we're going to go into war. you got to help us build these cities. They ended up tricking the Jews. They ended up saying, now you got to do this labor. But as much as they would afflict them, it didn't really matter how much taxes they paid or what they had to go through. They were still disgusted because of the children of Israel. Because they kept growing. Now, question over here is, well, why were the Egyptians disgusted? 
what did, what did they do? What did the Jews do that made the, that made? If you want to be angry at the Jews, you could be angry at the Jews, right? But why were they feeling disgusted? Because they were just having so many children. You guys got to stop having kids. You know, it's like the China. Like they wanted to make like a one child rule, but that didn't happen there either. Okay, what were they disgusted about? Kashe yanuoto, right? Rashi says in whatever way that they set their heart to afflict them, so was the heart of the Holy One. Which means that when they would afflict the Jewish people, Hashem gave who's there with us, He gave us the strength to overcome. You think you're in control of the circumstance that you're in, tuitions, money, donations, it's so much, it's so hard. Eh, not true. Rashi says, don't worry about the challenge. You rise to the challenge and let God do His part. Ken yirbe, ken ravava ken parats, right? He says, it's so they will multiply and they will gain strength means that they multiply and they gain strength. And that means that God says, don't worry about it. We'll give you the strength you need to keep doing what you got to do. Yiktsu. They were disgusted. Why were they disgusted? With their lives, Rashi says. The Egyptians were disgusted with their lives. They were disgusted with their lives because they were disgusted with themselves. Why? They were disgusted with themselves because the Jewish people reminded them that you could do all these things, have large families, build amazing institutions, have amazing education, and still not conform to your society. Right? And then the, Jew, the Egyptians come, they enslave the Jewish people with back-breaking labor. We read this in the Haggadah. The Jewish people were overwhelmed with the bricks and all kinds of labor in the field. It was exhausting. They were so tired. Maybe if they're so tired, we give them back-breaking work, they'll stop having kids. This will be a form of birth control. But you see, nothing worked. The Egyptian king makes a new decree. To who? To Lamayaladot. Ha'evriot. They don't have names. Interesting. No names, these people. Who are they? Lamayaladot ha'evriot. Okay, to these uh, women who were midwives, right? Shem achat shifra v'shem ha'shenit ha'yapu'ah. One was shifra and ma'pu'ah. And we know their real name was who? Miriam and Yochevet. Right? Why do they call them Shifran Pua? And, and this is where it's complicated. Right here is proof in the Pasuk that they didn't have Jewish names. These were Egyptian names that were given to them. The, the, the king would not allow them to use their Jewish names. And the question is why? What's so bad about your Jewish name? Why can't you have a Jewish name? And I'm telling you, your Jewish name, my friends, has so much to do with your identity. A name of something defines the essence of it. If you walk around being called a Miriam, a Rachel, a Leah, a beautiful, you know, typical biblical name, or whatever your name is, it reminds you of where you come from. It connects you to these people and the things, the sacrifice they did. But the Egyptian king understood this. If I remove their ability to connect to their identity and their past, I could get them to completely assimilate and break them. It wasn't, they couldn't break them by just doing backbreaking work. We're going to take away their identity and not give them even names. Shifra and Pur were told, you know what? I can't beat these people. I can't break them. But you know what you're going to do? I'm going to tell you what to do right now. He calls these midwives, When you deliver a Hebrew, when, you, when a woman, a Jewish woman is giving and going into labor, and you see it on a birth stool, it's a son, kill the son. He took Jewish maid serv- uh, midwives, you got you to euthanize, you got to euthanize, birth control here. You got to stop this population growth. Now remember, Egypt is one of the most fertile lands in the whole Middle East. They weren't worried about it. But the Nile River, endless food, fish, so much there. But what are they worried about? Consumption or the loss of their own identity? I want you to kill every single baby born, baby, baby that's born. Okay? In Bat, if it's a girl, let her live. We like girls in Egypt. Okay? We want a lot of women. We want to add women into our ability to marry them, but don't get rid of the boys. We don't need any boys. And we know that Midrash tells us that, that Paro's uh, uh, stargazers saw that there was going to be a boy that was going to be born with the power to overthrow his, his kingdom and his philosophy and his ideology. Okay. But these midwives were f- afraid. They were afraid of God. These two women, these mother and daughter, Miriam and Yocheved, are afraid of God and they rather put their lives at risk and break the law because what they felt that he asked was immoral. And they allowed the boys to live. And in this chut, what happens? Right? 
Listen to what happens. This is already we're at the Sheni right now. This is just this is just introduction. It's fascinating. He calls them back these midwives. He says, "What's going on? Why have you done this thing that you enable these boys to live? I see what's going on. There's too many boys in the streets. Where are all these Jewish boys coming from? But what do they say? They tell Paro, Jewish women are not like Egyptian women. <laughs> Only a Jewish woman could say that, right? Hena beterem tavo. Right? What would end up happening? They were skilled as midwives. And when the midwife would come, right, they already gave birth. They, they give birth without us. We get there, it's too late. We are not even in a position. They're having so many children so fast. We can't even, we can't even, we can't stop the kids from giving birth. We can't stop the births. We can't do the euthanasia. And this is their excuse. So listen to what it says. V'yitav elukim lemeladot. God benefited the wives. V'yarev ha'am yatzmu ma'od. And the people multiplied and became very strong. The Jews were still growing as a result of these two women and their sacrifice. This is proof, by the way, ladies that are here listening. It is through the acts of righteous women throughout history that the Jewish people have been saved. It's been your dedication and your commitment to remain Jewish, to instill Jewish values. It's through the women that we have survived. And by the way, in this generation, the same thing will happen. It's the Jewish women of this generation who stand up and work together. They'll have the ability of drawing us back on, t- on, on path, on target to get to where we need to get to. But now the midwives fear God that he made houses for them. Okay. And God calls to, uh, uh, what's it called? I'm so sorry about that. I'm going to silence it. There you go. He says to them, right? Every son who was born, you should cast into the Nile. Every daughter shall live. And, then, and this is where I'm going to kind of like, this last two more, two more psukim, and then we're going to call it a day. Okay, listen to this. A man from the house of Levi, right? A man in the house of Levi, went and married a daughter from the house of Levi. No names. It's a book of Shemot. <laughs> you can't, we know who this is. This is Amram. Right? This is Yocheved. Why can't we say their names? Because they had no names. These people already lost their identity. They were so lost. They were mindless, swarming people who didn't really know where they came from anymore. Mindless. All those children, everything that was built was lost. All that investment, gone. All that sacrifice, kimat, gone. Midrash tells us that what happens over here, this wasn't uh, Amram marrying uh, Yocheved for the first time. He divorced her. He divorced his wife. Imagine right now, I told you, the biggest leader of the Jewish people divorces his wife. He says, you know what? Game over. Jews, stop having children. There's too much pressure, too much taxes, too much backbreaking work, too much yeshiva bill tuition. I don't want this anymore. Hajj, I'm done. Enough. I don't want it. Just... Close shop. Everyone divorce your wife. This is what happened in Egypt. And Miriam comes to her father, Amram, and says, Dad, what are you doing? Your decree is worse than Paro. Not only are you going to ensure that the boys are not going to be born, but now the girls too. And he hears his daughter and says, you're right. And he ends up remarrying her. He ends up taking on a wife, again, remarrying his wife, at a time where it made absolutely no sense. Back, it was, it was impossible. It says that no one, no one ever escaped Egypt. You couldn't get out of that place. It was, it was, it was Fort Knox, lockdown. You're not going anywhere, and there's no names over here. But Tahera Isha, and a woman conceived. We don't know her name. Strange, right? But Tered Ben, and she had a son. But Tirek Oto, she sees him. Kitov, who doesn't, is very nice. Doesn't even give him a name. Also, but Spenei was right? She said she she said he you know she hid him for three months. They didn't know what to do with him. We know they put him in the basket, right? But Tachat Achotom Rachok Ledama. I said the sister. There's no name over here of the sister. The Tered Bat Paro. She sees him, stretches out, and she calls him Moshe Mishisiu Minamayim, right? And that's the story over here. Where are the names of all these people? In the beginning, we have these names of these amazing people, all the Shvatim, and now there's no names of any of the key characters. As a matter of fact, the only name we get is Moshe's name, and it's not even, it's not a name that's hit, that was given to by his birth mother. It's some adopted woman, an Egyptian, a non-Jewish woman who gives him the name. 
right? Strange. Now, we actually know the names of these two people that married one another, right? Yocheved and Amram. Now, let's try to explain this. We know that Amram and Yocheved were both born at a time of deep persecution, at a time where um, our oppressors treated us as if we were subhuman, no names. We saw this before in the Holocaust. They take away people's names, give them numbers, dehumanize them. Where do you think the Nazis got it from? Right here, my friends. Right? Um, we know that, um, you know, the, in respective of the circumstances that they were in, Amram's parents wanted his children to know that he was special. And they gave him the name Amram. What does Amram mean? Right? Amram means, comes from the words Am, nation, Ram, an elevated people. The parents named his, their child, their son, gave him a Hebrew name in Egypt. You're special. You come from a uh, elevated people, right? It doesn't matter what how people treat you. It doesn't matter what the nations say you are or not. You're just a Jew, right? What a powerful name to give a kid in, in exile. And Yocheved, Yo, God's name, Chebed, Kavod, God of honor. She was born at a time where people were questioning the, the existence of God, right? If, if, they accepted, if they accepted God's existence, then why was God allowing so many evil to happen in the world? How do you explain this? And her parents wanted her to know. Yocheved, God is a God of honor, and he will keep his promise irrespective of what challenges they find. The Torah wants us to know that whoever you are, you could be a, an, an astounding person, but if, forget about your, 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 your yichut, right? You forget about your parents, your grandparents, and the wonderful lineage that you have. That's not important. Any regular man, a person with no name, a woman, a man with no name, and can produce a regular child, right? And that regular child later on as an adult can use all of God, the God-given talent that was given to him. And if you reach into your own personal wonderful potential, you can become the Moses of your generation. These people had no names. They were lost already. But the people that are emerging from the story, we want to connect them to the people that were, but they have their own story to tell. A unique mission to re-inspire a people that were so broken. You see how hard Moshe had such a hard time convincing them. He needed signs and miracles and all those things. He still couldn't do it. Do you know why? Because they lost their name. You know what your name is? Your name is your essence. Your name is your mission statement. What are you here to accomplish? The Jewish people lost their faces. They lost their name. They lost the ability to achieve what they were meant to achieve, to be a Yisrael's princes of God. Not to capitulate to the Egyptian society, but to elevate society. Not to say, ah, we're just going to be Shiratzim, just going to go ahead and have fun all day and all night. Let's make babies for the sake of making babies. Make babies. Have fun. But no, we have a moral purpose here. We're meant to elevate ourselves. We're meant to become bigger, greater people. Otherwise, you, my friends, are just a slave to the culture that you're in. And you want, if you want to be free, what is real freedom? Freedom is going to be coming up in the next Pashiot. Freedom has to do with this book. This book is not just Stam, the book of, of, uh, of names for, for no reason. This is the book of names because the ultimate name in all of this book is God's name. Elohim, Shakai, Amonai. That's the name that you and I are trying to see behind the scenes. What does... What does Hashem say to Abraham? Yeah, your children will be a stranger in a strange land. But remember that they will, they will be counted like the stars. They'll be as numerous as the stars. They'll be counted like the stars in exile. They're lost without a clear face. They're faceless. They're being subjugated by Paro. And still in that place of darkness, of Metzer, Mitzrayim, in a place which is constricted, they couldn't have the ability to think. You had Paro coming from the word Pera, a man who uses his, his, his mouth, his, his voice, his ability to articulate, to crush another people, right? That's what you had going on over here. How do you break all of that? You bring someone who's able to be Mishisium in a mind, someone who could split the water, someone who could come out of a place of death and bring life into the world, remembering that you and I could do the same thing. I believe that we are also living today in a time of exile. And we are also living in a time of names. What do you identify with? What's your name? 
are you identifying more with your Western culture values? Are you identifying more with your Jewish values? You see, it's going to happen very quickly. In, in our generation, we're going to see what I call the great selection happening, just like it did in Mitzrayim. There going to be two groups of people. The people that fade away, like so many Jews have in the past. And another group of people that stand up and are willing to do what they need to do to maintain, preserve, inspire the next generation. How does it happen? And you got to figure out your own mission, my friends. But you want to know why it's called the Book of Names? Because every single person's name, everyone has a unique mission. They lost that power. Eventually, they get it back. How? By remembering where they came from. You can't advance in life if you don't have a clear vision as to where you came from. You can't move forward if you don't clarify your past. I'm not saying you have to be defined by your past. But you have to clarify who you are so you can know where you got to go. If you believe that everything is fine and perfect and dandy, you're not going anywhere. You're stuck. When you're able to recognize the chisronot, when you're able to recognize the things that you need to overcome, the challenges that you need to break free from, that is where greatness comes. Moshe is stuck. Doesn't want to do it. Doesn't believe in himself. Doesn't find that courage to do it. God has to push him to do it. He creates circumstances that are hard. I don't know if the circumstances in the world are going to get better, but I do know this. Um, if they stay the same or they get a little bit more difficult, it's going to require each of us to make an adjustment. Are you willing to stand up for your name? Are you willing to stand up for what you believe in? Are you willing to go the extra mile to become something more? That is what the book of Shemot is. The Geula, the Exodus, our redemption, depends on our ability to take people with no names like me and you and turn ourselves into people with names Bezrat Hashem that will be remembered forever. Wishing you all a Shabbat Shalom and amazing week. Thank you so much for joining and listening. Bezrat Hashem, I'll see you all next week. Questions?